Second separating these two teams from the shootout. And here's Drew moving back into the game. Score! Welcome to the Flyer Zoom Room, a phillysportsnetwork.com production with your hosts, Ricky Amandeo. It's only a game. Why do you have to be mad? Derek Bob. Stop looking at me, Swan. Liam Jenkins. Eric Reese. Leaf eater. Losing a giraffe. And Matt Stinger. But luckily for you, Thessence, someone in this room has got some jam. Uh, hey, everybody. Welcome to the Flyer Zoom Room, phillysportsnetwork.com. I'm alongside the Phillies Flyers writers here, and uh, we're going to get going. Happy Wayne Gretzky Day. Why do I say that? Well, 21 years ago today was his final game. And, yes, he did score a point. He ended his career on a loss, but in, with an assist, which the best stat in all of sports, I find, is that Wayne Gretzky, who had 894 goals in the league and is the NHL's all-time leading scorer, take away those 894 goals, just count up his assists, he's still the NHL leader in scoring points. That's just crazy. Um, <laughs> anyway, I'm the Delco Dope, as you can tell – See there, Matt Stinger. You can find me on Twitter, Delco Dope, Delco Dope uh, Sports on Facebook as well. And I am a staff writer for the Flyers. I also help cover the Phillies. And next up, we'll kick it over to Ricky. How you doing, Rick? Hey, how you doing, guys? Uh, yeah, I'm my Twitter handle is my name, Ricky Avenue 8, uh, lead writer for PSN, kind of cover as many bounds as I can. And uh, pass this one along, to Eric. You say Derek or Eric? Oh, okay. Eric. <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, Eric Reese, PSN, as you see my handle right there. Um, just a new lead writer for the Philadelphia Flyers team. Um, I really have a lot of hot takes on Eric Lindros that people disagree about. So, you know, <laughs> just don't at me. It's fine. <laughs> I'm Derek. Derek. I am the managing editor for the Flyers division here. I lead all these goons. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Pod Street Bob, and you can find all my all of my work as always at Philly Sports Network. And I'm going to toss it to the leader of all of us, whichever way he might be. I don't know, <laughs> Liam Jenkins. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm carrying on my streak of intruding on 100 percent of every show we've ever put out. So uh, there's a running record. I have to come on at least once. So I've attended one Flyers game in Prague. So basically this whole run of Flyers Zoom Room would just be filled with, and I go, yeah, remember in Prague when that happened? And you're like, yeah, you mentioned that eight times now. Um, but yeah, I kind of do it all at, at PSN and, and look after these lovely men and they do amazing work. And I just sit here and get sloppy about it with a man bun. So that's, that's why I'm just kind of here to, to witness the greatness, really. <laughs> only three to five times a week, though, is when he gets sloppy. Yeah, just only three to five. Well, the, the, uh, yeah, I'd say that's a good average, right? We're being, we're being modest about it. You'll get I got that people. answer right, so I tend to agree with it. <laughs> oh, whatever. Well, this, this is our initial show, so uh, as we carry out and go through some bumps and bruises and growing pains, we hope to bring more of these type of shows in the near future. Everyone in this that you can see on this uh, screen is going to take a turn at hosting and leading the train. And tonight it's my night because I volunteered my dumb ass to do it. So, um, yeah. So what we're going to do here is just start talking flyers. It's been a, a uh, long month of no hockey. Uh, you, we can't even go out and play hockey without the threat of a virus or someone in a mask telling us to go inside or, you know, but it is what it is. And um, we're going to talk, the, the one thing I wanted to say, first off, congrats to Eric and, and uh, Ricky on Thank your uh, promotion. You. Thank you. Thank you guys you. Have, been, have been killing it in terms of continuing to drive coverage when there's really no stories to ha be had. You're, you're delving into archives and just doing a great job of, of putting out there some information that, you know, people who are jonesing for hockey can read about hockey. And that's, you know, exactly what we want to do. That's, I guess – the vision Liam had and entrusted it to Derek and you guys have been rolling it. I've just been kind of coattailing you. And, uh, you know, that's why I felt the need to take on tonight. So first topic we want to get to is the NHL coming back. And if they are, what's going on, how long are they going to play? What's going to happen? 
Just last week, I posted an article on, obviously, phillysportsnetwork.com, talking about Bettman and an interview he gave. And uh, it looks as though he's ready to go into the summer, guys. And, uh, you know, they talked of neutral sites. They talked of no fans, um, which it just seems to be a flyer way that when you have the best home ice advantage in the NHL, that you would get to play the rest of your games with no fans and not in your barn. So, uh Anyone want to jump in? Just go ahead and uh, talk about what you think about with this. And well, I mean, oh, so you go, Ricky. I, I will wait. It's oh, okay. All right. I was thinking, <laughs> like, I was thinking, like, we. I genuinely believe that we would have been the top seed in the Metro, like genuinely. And just the whole fact that this happening just angers me. And like, I'm sure, like you guys and everyone else, like sitting around, like I'm just sitting around with my girlfriend watching mindless TV all day. I need, I need sports. So uh, I wouldn't mind this as long as I'm assuming they take all the precautions to be safe. As long as everyone's safe, I am 100% for bringing this season back. I don't care how long it takes playing the last 13 games left, I believe, in the season for the Flyers. So the last dozen or so games go into the playoffs. I don't care as long as there's hockey back. You know, I I heard there was a uh, a 68-game rollback idea they they were talking about. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, that puts the Flyers on top of the Metro. Um, that, I think that was the one d- day or so, or like very short time right after we beat, we beat the, uh, the Capitals. So yeah. if that's the case, I mean, I'm all for it, 68 games. But we're, we're in regardless. Um, the home ice, you know, that was a great idea before COVID, but now it doesn't really matter. So I don't really care if we're first seed or second seed or honestly eighth seed. Just put us in the playoff. Everybody has the same advantage. Um, I would love to see all this start to, you know, take take shape um, after the NHL mandated quarantine, which is extended through the 30th of this month now. And if they want to talk about playing in like in New Hampshire or a, a South Dakota or a North Dakota, somewhere where there's not as many people, I mean, it's cold there. So you're going to get your training, you know, exactly the way you would think about it inside the rinks. It's, you know, it's all just low temperatures inside the barns anyway. You might as well just pull them out where it's naturally cold. And uh, about two or three weeks later, once you're done training or once you got your legs back, just fire right into the playoffs. Don't even worry about the rest of the season. That's kind of where I'm at right now. I think you got to understand. I think everyone is really on board with the fact we, the, the, there is no more regular season. It's over. Mm-hmm. The, yeah. the question is, how do you determine who gets in? And I know there was talk about, like, do you do, like, one-game playoffs between, like, the bottom four teams, you know, the bottom, uh, the bottom team in each division and, and the two wild cards or, or the, the four, guy, four teams? I mean, again, in the, in the one piece I did, I think it was, like, everybody in the Metro, with the exception of the Devils, was within one game. One game of the playoffs that's that's crazy and considering the rangers who were like down and out two months ago fought back into it you know and um so what is fair i mean if i'm an owner you say oh well let's roll it back to 68 games you know i think the islanders get in whereas right now they're sitting on the outside you know and then i think that that either that screws over either columbus or um or Carolina and you know they're like well wait a minute we're here now you know so you have the argument either way as to what to do it's just coming up with a a system where these owners are going to be like we have 12 13 14 games left we're one point out of the playoff you can't just say no we don't make it you know even though that may just be what happens no matter what happens some team somewhere is going to feel slighted you know it you know you play 70 games as opposed to 69 and you're like, Oh, well now I'm in eighth place. But before this last game, I was in ninth and I'm out. I'm on the outside looking in the 68 game rollback makes sense. If that's the least amount of games played by an NHL team, that's the game number that you need to roll back to. And with that being said, the flyers are the number one team in the Metro. Uh, Much like a lot of you have said, I'll echo it. First seed, second seed. I don't care. The flyers will get in no matter what, because they're there. And honestly, if it weren't for the fact that we've been laid off for this long, the Flyers would have made some noise. They were one of, if not the hottest team in the NHL, winning nine of their last ten. I have no qualms with saying I really think the Flyers had a very good shot this year. And call it biased because, you know, that's the team we cover. But they're hot. 
They're also playing for something greater than hockey with everything that's happened with Lindblom. The pieces were coming together for the Flyers, and it just sucks that this had to happen this year. And quite frankly, I think the only team that, uh, Derek, um, if I'm not being biased, the only team that we really had to worry about was Tampa Bay Lightning. I'm convinced. Mm-hmm. I'm convinced that, quite frankly, we'd, we'd be in the finals um, this season. I, I, it's not – the Lightning is a, probably the only team I can see uh, in a, in a seven-game series, you know, maybe going down in five or six games because they've been they've, – they've had our number all season. But the Bruins, uh, we yeah, we lost to them just before COVID. But besides that, we had the Bruins number. We had the Penguins number. We've had the Capitals number. Uh, more times than not, we've had the uh, – you know, whatever other, whatever other team is out there, Rangers, uh, Hurricanes, Islanders, teams. all of those. No. They didn't lose to the Blue Jackets this year at all. I mean, they were. We also, I mean, you look at the other teams. They always uh, lose to the Blue Jackets. If you look at the other teams in, in the West, um, we had the Blues number, and we had the Blues number with Brian Elliott playing, and and not with Carter Hart in there. So you're talking about another team that's a very Alex good Lyon team. as well. Yeah, like oh yeah, Alex Lyon as well, and that was the Avalanche too. Um, yep. So we have a bunch of teams that are in what their top five. Like we're, I, I think. If you look at the 68 game rollback, I think the Flyers are the fifth best team in the league, which is an elite team. If you're top five anything in what you do, you're an elite. Um, so looking at that, I think really the Flyers are probably going to be one or one or two by the end of the playoffs. And I think that uh, that team that may that might put it the Flyers at two is probably more than likely going to be the Lightning. They're the toughest team, not not orange and black. I think it's like it, it's all really interesting. I think the Flyers are in a really nice spot where no matter what happens now, you're kind of guaranteed postseason hockey, right? Which is what everyone was screaming for at the start of the year. That's the one good takeaway. Um, interesting parallel, though, and I, I wanted to raise this with you guys. And I heard it earlier today and I wanted to save it for, well, specifically for this conversation. Um, the championship, the English football championship, runs at almost a parallel season to the NHL. Where they're like 16 games out of the playoffs. Um, and they were discussing when their league comes back. And the team I support's manager had a radio interview today and he wasn't even concerned about the team. He was like, how do you get players to train? You've got players that have got wives who are pregnant. You've got players that have got families where there may be special circumstances that don't want to be exposed. Um, You've then got a situation where a lot of those contracts that expired June, July, August, what if you're not playing hockey until June, July, August? If those contracts then expire and you're looking at free agency, do those players automatically get updated? And if they do, and they go, oh, do you know what? Fine, we'll see out the season. We'll play a game. Let's say you're a veteran guy. You're looking for one last contract with a team. And this would have been the end of the season. You can enter the next year with a set of fresh legs. Do you really want to run back through six, seven games to try and get through a playoffs run, risk getting a long-term injury and jeopardize that next contract? And that's something which no one is, is right. And it wasn't until I heard that, I was like, that's actually a really good point. Like, forget the whole, the fan logistics and the empty arenas and the travel and that stuff. Like, the players themselves have now got futures to worry about and families to worry about. And it goes so much bigger than just the game of hockey where all of a sudden it's like, well, okay, even if we do get to the playoffs, how much of that team core is going to be the same? Like, depending on the date it's hit, are we really going to see the same caliber of hockey is it going to be players kind of said hey I'm out of this you go do your thing I'm going to sit out for a month and then get my bags is that what are your thoughts on that because I heard it again earlier today I thought well there'd be no better four people to bring this up with I think it's going to delay next year yeah that's what I'm afraid of been it's already been kind of thrown around that uh I think uh Pierre LeBron tweeted out that they're ready to postpone till November if need be the start of the season. So, I mean, that would just, I would assume that would just push back everything, but you know, hockey guys are different, you know? Yeah. They might be wanting that contract, but if they have the opportunity to hoist a cup, I mean, that's, that's everything to them. You know, if like these guys just want their name on that cup and it's just a different breed of professional athlete than Mm -hmm. out there that these guys just, that's what they want. And I think they're like, yeah, whatever. You know, yeah, every single one of those conference call transcripts that we that we've been doing uh, writing um, writing pieces on, every single one of those players want to go back and say, "Hey, we miss hockey probably as much as Philadelphia fan base does, which is a lot." Mm-hmm. Um, Carter Hart wants to go back and, and play pretty much ASAP, and I know that Kevin Hayes is feeling the same way. It, it echo it for literally every single person. Uh, 
Sean Couturier, Scott Lawton, Joel Therabee, any one of those players want to go back. And then actually, it's funny, Liam, you're, you're bringing up uh, the, the game in Prague earlier in the beginning of the season. Um, Therabee was not on the roster as a, as a, on the Philadelphia Flyers roster for that game and ended up being the 11th, yeah, number 11 in the leading scorers for the Philadelphia Flyers. That's a rookie season where you didn't start, but next thing you know, you're up there with players like Kevin Hayes, like the ones I just mentioned, the ones that are mainstays. So I think specifically for rookies like Farabee, they're looking to, you know, to get back onto the ice. It doesn't matter any sort of contract uh, dispute, whether it's you're coming back too early and that could be an injury. They just want to come back in there and hoist a cup. I mean, I, I go back to even years ago on other teams like Joe Thornton. He was playing with like holes in his lung, like a puncture to holes in his lung. I'm like, yeah, I don't think that's a, a basketball move over there. I think it's a hockey player who wants to cup more than anything else in his life. So I think I think these guys will come back and uh, they'll just bite the bullet and play how, however they need to and extend the season start let and you know until November, like you were saying, if they have to. Yeah, but, I uh, oh, I was gonna say kind of just kind of just to bounce off here, Eric. Like I'm pretty sure I saw Jordan Hall tweet. Uh, I think we had 11 or 12 rookies this year play for us at one point, which is like an astronomical amount. And I don't know off the top of my head, like the average age of the team or anything like that. But we have guys that are don't have a lot of mileage and they're just as hungry as some of those vets. So I think 100% they'll be full-fledged, whether it's kind of like you said, with fans, no fans, whenever they get started. I think the Flyers are one of the only teams that will be okay playing kind of seasons with lesser of an off season, put it that way. Yeah. I think my only other problem or like kind of concern would be, do you not think that, let's just say hypothetically, hockey comes back, flyers go all the way, hoist the cup, they get the parade, it's the most iconic thing ever. Mm-hmm. And from every, it will forever be known as the season that was, yeah, but it wasn't a full year. And yeah, but it was because of this and because of that. And it's yeah. like, I can't. You won the cup anyway. You win the cup. Like, you win the cup. My rebuttal to that, and I think a it's cup the is a one, cup. is a cup. do you yes. take back that, that 2008 World Series? Yeah. Right? Exactly. Does anybody, does anybody talk about that? Oh, it rained halfway through. They had to play three more innings the next night. <laughs> Not so. only that, I, I after the Phils won that World Series, you heard Boston fans being like, well, if you played uh, the, the Red Sox, you would have lost. I was like, yeah, but you had, <laughs> you had, had to beat Tampa. Yeah. yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah but, we, but we didn't, though. We didn't have to play you, so – well, you beat I, who's like, in front of you. You win. You win under the circumstances that you win, and and you know what? In the end of the day, they're hoisting the cup, and we're happy, and we laugh. Like if the Tampa Bay Lightning get out in the first round, and the Flyers make it to the second round, I'm hot dogging and grandstanding to everybody. That doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't matter because oh yeah, you know what? We might have not, you know, got as far as we would have if we played the Lightning, but we didn't have to. So. Give me the cup. That's basically how I feel about that point. I don't care how it goes. You can put an asterisk next to it or not. I mean, it didn't stop the Patriots from getting Super Bowls, but I'm gonna stop my <laughs> I'm gonna stop my hot dog in the grandstanding right there. So. <laughs> well, I'm looking at the uh, the number of rookies right now, and yeah, Faraby got. Um, let's see, Abe Kubal. Let's see, Morgan three. Frost. Frost, yep. Uh, Bunneman. Bunneman. Andrioff. Kasha. Are we counting? Uh, Andrioff's not a rookie. Let me no, see. he's not. Uh. No. Mark David Friedman. David Cash. I know he didn't play. Friedman. Kasha. Was this? Yeah, this is his first. Uh, this was Kasha's first NHL taste. Um, yeah, so he was. Is he technically a rookie? Yeah, he is. I, I guess so, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so would Phil Myers would t- technically be a rookie, too, yeah. I think. Yeah. Phil Myers, yeah. Um, Carson, Torinsky, yeah. Friedman, Friedman, yeah. Um, I lost count. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty sure Hall said 11, so I, I can find I the trust tweet. it. Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's roughly yeah, it's roughly that much, honestly. Probably like yeah. 10 or 11. And I can I might have just lost count a little bit, but yeah. we we have this is one of the things I saw on a, uh, on a face Facebook group today, and um, the article was kind of talking about how the the Flyers. They're, they need depth. I'm like, if there's anything we have on this team, it's depth. depth. <laughs> you know, so oh, I don't yeah. think we need depth. I think we are the one of the deepest teams in the league. And, and we were talking about uh, the youth of this team a little bit earlier. Yeah. 
just because of how young and how talented this team is to, to be a top five team this season, I'm thinking that uh, the Flyers are going to be one of the premier teams in the NHL for probably just at least the next seven seasons. That's at least what I'm thinking. Like They're young. They're talented. They've got it. I mean, the drafting was done incredibly well. They're set yeah. up very well for the future as long as some of these prospects panned out, pan out. We know that's not always the case, right. but they'll at least get some solid middle to bottom six forwards. That top line, I mean, they're not getting any younger, but at the same rate, they're still producing pretty well. So Tori is a very good 27. Next. Yeah. yeah he seems like he's been here for 30 years. He's 27 <laughs> years old. And Three years younger than me. What am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> like, what am I doing with my life? You're not Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a wrist shot like him, I'm telling you. But, um, would you rather have a slap shot like me? That's the question. Yeah, see, that's no one has a slap shot quite weird. like you, Liam. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Just imagine if it hit the puck. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if buts and maybe's, Eric. If buts and maybe's. <laughs> that's a heavy. It's a heavy Chris Ponger slap shot, man. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! Just watching yeah. those uh, that that comeback, the best comeback in pretty much sports history, in my opinion. Um, Chris Pronger, his slap shot was bar none. One of the, probably one of the most dangerous slap shots of any uh, defenseman that we've ever had on the Philadelphia Flyers. I still think back to that piece that uh, that I that I wrote. I was like, instead of getting uh, Lucas Sabisa and we, you know, getting Carlson instead, we could have still had Pronger on that team and not had Perrant. So if you get rid of Perrant, well, that's the player that ran over Boucher and and tore his leg up in the playoffs. So if the whole butterfly effect happens, do you have two Hall of Fame defensemen and a healthy Boucher for that run? That's kind of something I've been to toying with a little bit in my head. Sounds like a great article. I know. To build on <laughs> that for the next one. Let's just not tell that one for now. <laughs> if only there was a website where we could post that article, you know? Yeah, yeah. anyone <laughs> know it? I know a guy. <laughs> 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 so let's uh let's move to uh what do we think will be going on with the flyers penguin series right now well personally i think just because it's the penguins it probably would have been six seven games six probably i just because the penguins but kind of like the reasoning comes kind of like uh derek made, wrote an article i think back in february that touched on the last 19 games of the big guys and i was look i was reading that a little earlier and uh, let's see, nearly a fifth of Voracek's points come in the home stretch of the season. A quarter of Drew's come in the last 19 games. And Couturier's, 28% of Couturier's come in the last 19 games. Over the last five God, seasons. I'm such terribly. a nerd. <laughs> but, <laughs> but that goes to show how, like, they were heating up. The team was heating up. A.B.'s a genius. And everything was just lined up in their favor. They would have the Penguins probably would have been one of their harder opponents just because of the Penguins. Yeah, and you're going to get you're going to get Crosby's best. And, and yeah. I mean, oh, yeah. as much as we hate the guy, God is, respect is him. he the he's got to be the hardest guy to get off a puck in the NHL? You know, his leg strength and core strength has got to be through the friggin' roof. As when I wrote the recap about the one game, he was checked into the boards by Coburn when he had the puck kept the puck after or no i'm sorry but he dished the puck away and then as soon as he got checked into the boards he literally just bounced right off and then went straight to the net finished it up with a one-timer it was a goal it's insane the guy just has a nose for the puck and just is so difficult to take off a puck yep i just think if it, crosby for me is that he's one of those players where you hate him if he's not on your team and you love him if he's on yours it's like anyone that is not a penguins fan will likely admire the greatness but despise playing against him because he, he, he's just horrible. Like, there's nothing you can do. He's just sort of, it's Crosby kind of controls Crosby and that you accept it for what it is and you control every other tangible. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is probably, I've only, you know, been a, a recent, I, I guess, grower into the sport of hockey. But from what I've seen and looking back and especially with some of those series that you guys have been putting out, um, I, I would have think if there was ever a chance that the Flyers would have got some, probably some much needed revenge and just to kind of get that upper hand once again, this was going to be the year, I think. And it's it's a shame that it's not quite happened. But in our heads, every night, not in a weird way, but I'm sure we're all dreaming. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, you dream uh, about beating the Pens. Yeah. <laughs> well, and they, they, they had the success, too. 
friends is pretty right. pretty much in our favor. Yeah. Well, yeah. remember uh, when they like hadn't lost in, when they got the new arena and the Flyers just went in there. It was like a, a home game and mm-hmm. a guaranteed win. That was for what a couple years. Oh yeah. yeah. Sergey uh, Bobrovsky was right like the team. owner of the Pens. They were decent ours. <laughs> Yeah, we the Flyers basically broke in. What is it? PPG Paints Arena, yeah, or whatever it was. I guess now it's something new. I I don't keep the XL guy. Center or something like that or whatever. Uh, it was the XL Center. That's yeah. what it was. And now it's PPG Paints. I guess I do keep track of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but they owned it. I remember being like almost depressed when they lost their first game there. I'm like, well, there goes that That's momentum. Sad. You know, it was right, like yeah. it was like <laughs> kicking the knackers. <laughs> that is a british british uh reference to our fearless leader liam there <laughs> nine out of ten well done you slipped it faster. <laughs> uh, gonna watch this came a long way from that seven to one loss uh early in the season and then the next time they play them they go right into uh i believe it was at, at Pittsburgh. brian elliott got the three nothing shutout and then Following that, uh, Pittsburgh won in, in overtime, four to three. So I think this series would have been pretty close. I think it also probably would have went six games, um, sprinkling a couple overtime dramas in there. But I think the Flyers would have ultimately won that series four to two, just because of the momentum they had. I mean, moving a little even past the Penguins, because I I think we all agree it would have been a bit of a deeper series. Uh, definitely wouldn't have been a breeze by, but it probably would be a little easier moving forward in hindsight, hopefully. Uh, but if we played the Penguins, it most likely would have been a two or the three seed. And we probably would have ended up playing the Capitals, who, assuming they would be, I think Carolina was the top wild card team. So, so probably would have played Capitals in the next round. And uh, I mean, I think Capitals would probably be an easier matchup to the Penguins, in my opinion. But you guys could. That one's up for debate, but that's well, a tough if they, one. If they roll back to the sixty-eight games, I think the Islanders then jump, and they are the seventh. Oh, okay. So how would the Islanders oh. Caps? Actually, it would be the Islanders Flyers and the Caps Penguins, right? Ooh. I'm not a fan of that matchup. The Flyers yeah. don't play well against the Islanders this year, and I I don't like the Islanders. Yeah. <laughs> Here's a question. It's a bit unrelated. Why are they why are they called the Islanders? Because is New York an island or is that just I thought it was mainland? It's on Long Island. Long Island. Long Island. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah. Silly question. My bad. Maybe. On Long Island, not in Long Island. Yeah. Made that uh, they should be the Long Islanders, but I guess that was too long of a name. They used <laughs> to have uh, their oh my god, now I'm blanking on That's the, a dad uh, joke. He's a brand new dad, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> I was good with dad jokes before I was a dad. <laughs> Their old Islanders logo looked like the uh, the fi- like the fishermen from the. Um, I, was, I was just going to bring that up. That you know what I'm talking about. Oh what, what, my what god, they, they fisherman they Gordon or whatever. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 It was the like worst a... uniform change I think in history. You know. Oh, I thought I was going to be my own island for like five minutes. Going, yeah, he looked like a fisherman. People were like, a lot of people nah, look like they're... fishermen. They're like, <laughs> like the guy from the fish sticks package. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'll have to find a graphic and insert that in there. <laughs> I, if we're going to, like, circle back around to that Flyers-Penguin series, that I guess it might not have happened. But to Ricky's point, the Penguins and the Flyers always have a really tough matchup. And it's not just tough for the Flyers. It's tough for the Penguins, too. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's that cross-state rival. One of you, It's your most bitter, bitter rival. And that series, no matter how good or how bad each team is, it's going to go – six or likely seven games Mm -hmm. I think that you've got a young goaltender in Carter Hart who you know if he rises to the occasion I think he just completely surpasses expectations if he doesn't I think he for lack of a better term poops the bed I hate to say that but you know you look at it with the Flyers in general you have a very good mix of those younger players and those veteran players where those veteran players can kind of talk those guys off the ledge and say, listen, you know, this is how we're going to do things. This is how the playoffs work. You know, just settle down, play your game, go out there, and let's do our thing. I really – I'm of the same mindset. I think the Flyers would have handled their business there in the first round if it came to the Penguins. Islanders, different story. Still think they could have came out on top. I definitely think that series is going seven, though. So, if we're looking at the points – 
currently and not doing the 68-game rollback. This is how the playoff picture looks, at least for the Eastern Conference. You got Boston against Columbus. You got Tampa Bay, Toronto, Washington, Carolina, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. We talk about Philadelphia, Pittsburgh. I'm pretty sure Washington beats Carolina. So, yeah, I'm willing to bet that uh, – like, like we're, what we're saying so far is pretty much par for the course. On the other hand, um, Boston and Columbus, I'm taking Boston that – I'll take Tampa Bay, Toronto. Like I'm, I'm picking favorites right here. Basically, all those these teams are the favorites to win their series. Yeah. But um, what would you say, Tampa Bay and Boston? Because that's really when we we talk about going into the uh, semifinals. That's what we're talking about right here. No, not wait. Is it semifinals? No, semi second. Be the Eastern Conference. Uh, semifinals. It'd be the conference. Yeah. I think Boston wins that series. Tampa always finds a way to choke no matter what round. They choke yeah. somehow. I mean, you saw it, what, last year when they got swept by Columbus, you know? Yeah. It was last when, year, two years ago. when they went uh, to the finals, what they, they were riddled with injuries. It was like they shouldn't have been there. They, they, I mean, they had a great team, but they they had so many injuries that I, I don't even know how many games, playoff games, Stamkos played that year. I don't think he played many. No, he was I, – I remember him being out and hurt. I just don't remember to the extent. Yeah. My fear with uh, the Lightning, though, is that they're kind of like the Capitals and they're just kind of bound – they might be bound to break through eventually. Like yeah. the Capitals are up there and they got – eh, who knows? Maybe that's us now. I don't know. Yeah, I think it's our turn. It's the Flyers' turn. They, yeah. they You know, they need to – It's been a while. And it just, it just sucks because, I mean, you know, with the exception of October, which we weren't sure how they were going to come out anyway, you know, new coaching, fairly young team, you know, the system's – were put in place but not quite in place you know they come out with it like just over 500 killer november they start mm -hmm. december off and then boom you know the bullshit three game for farabee i mean you, yeah. get, you get like the oscar limbaum news which just sucked the life out of them you know yeah. i mean i don't care what you say you know you didn't have connect me i think for that avalanche series right or did he get hurt yeah. after that he was out for a couple of weeks. yeah he was out for a couple came home um we, we missed hart for a little bit too yeah yeah we you did. know what but i i think that was actually good for him because when he came back that whole road woes he he had a big road win like right away too <laughs> And it seemed to kind of turn the tide. Now, I mean, still using the two goalie system was was really smart to help you know keep him settled. He, they're going to have to ride him for the the playoffs. You know, you're not going to be doing the two goalie system. It's going to be hard show. Dino's well, been doing a much better job than Hackstall was of handling the goalie situation because look at the injuries last year. You had a guy like Stellars who had just come off of major knee surgery for the second time on the same knee. And he's like, let's play this guy like five straight games. You know, what's the worst that could happen? Well, you got hurt. Yeah, the worst <laughs> thing that could happen is you go through eight goalies in the season. That's the worst thing. Yeah. And that happened. You got an anomaly. You pick up, <laughs> and you it happened. You're right. Picked up you, know, Pickard, but we, you picked up uh, McKenna off of waivers. You were going through the bottom of the barrel when it comes to goalies. And that was, God, whoa, if I could forget last season. Well, I mean, well let's just go off script here for that. a second. Let's and let's talk about AD a little bit. And, and talk about the predecessor. Ricky, didn't you do the interview with uh, Abe Kubel? Yeah, I talked. Yeah, I mean, you, you had a line in there, or to, I guess it was to us, and it yeah. said everything there is to say about our, the previous coach. And, and I wasn't a hack stall hater. Like, a lot of Flyers fans were. I always wanted to give the guy benefit of the doubt because he had that success at the college level. But You're a bigger I mean, man than me. But, you know, <laughs> you know, like, I remember last year all the talk of Abe Kubel and just being like, I I'm not – I wasn't seeing it, but I wasn't seeing it because it wasn't getting shown. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't um, – it, it wasn't – put him in a role where he can thrive like A.B. did. You want to touch on that? What did he talk about this year? He was – I mean, away from the interview with him, like, just watching him, like, it's baffling how he can play. He's kind of like – I don't want to say similar to Scott Walton, but in the terms of versatility and the, the grit, like, he's got that same – uh, feature and I feel like AV finally unleashed that. Uh, when I was talking to him, I'm trying to remember the exact quote so I don't misquote him, but it was something along the lines of he finally feels comfortable and he yeah. feels like he has a role and he feels more confident now that he's comfortable, which I'm sure 99% of the players, I don't know how old he is off the top of my head, but under 25, 24, 
would say the same exact thing, which kind of goes to Derek's point earlier. I think uh, Hart would be perfectly fine in the playoffs just because, I mean, I'm 20. I know I couldn't handle that type of pressure. I could barely handle pressure of taking a test for college. But, uh, <laughs> but like, the dude – what is what was Hart's record this year? 24-13-3. And, and, I mean, obviously he's better at home, so the pressure could get to him on the road. But that his – I just feel like in a people perspective away from hockey, his demeanor is just off the charts. That's something that I wish I had. So put it that way. So like just that whole comfort level, I think AV goes to show that he's going to have a martini, put it that way. That's just, his, that's his personality. Like that's who he is. And that's what the Flyers need. That's what they, that's what the young team needed. So. Can I put it into perspective? 23. Yeah. To put it into perspective, too, we touched on this, John and I, on uh, Pod Street Bullies last week. Albany Cubell last year averaged like eight minutes a night, which you can't get much out of eight minutes a night on ice. And now he's averaging just like over 14 minutes. So there's clearly, you know, that's a six minute difference. That's a pretty sizable difference in time on ice. There's a comfort level that comes with that. So it's like, hey, I can do more in an expanded role. Let me show you. AV was like, show me. And guess what? That's what we've got now. Albe Cubell's really found his spot in this roster. And it's awesome because I've loved him ever since he's been kind of like teetering at the beginning of the season. Everybody's like, oh, you send him down. You might lose him. And I'm like, well, yeah, you could lose him for nothing. And that would suck. And everybody's like, uh, who cares? I'm like, I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I care. Yeah, he's, it, there's, there's nights where he looks like he's the best skater on the ice and he's oh, yeah. flying around and he's banging. And, and you, you know, I think comparing him to Scott Lawton is fantastic because Lawton is that type Great of comparison. insane player that do anything, anything for the team. And just, you know, Lawton's just like, he's, you know, he's a flyer, you know, he's and, a and he's a flyer. Like, I, I, think I don't I... want to see him. I remember, what was it? They say uh, they saved him on the expansion draft, and I think so. Yeah, yeah, they did. Or they they or or whatever it was protected and him. They protected mm-hmm. him, and he started off that next season as one of the best flyers, like in the yep. first like however many games. I think he got hurt too after that, but um, yeah. he was like this guy's intensity is is just man. He's a he's a Philadelphia flyer, and I'm you know he's just a good dude too. Absolutely. Like a lot of the coaching stuff, like going back to AV, and I promise, I know, well, I know it's going to happen, but I'm going to talk about Prague a lot. But um, that first week, <laughs> and that, no, no, because when I went to that team and AV talked for the first time, and the way that ahead of that game, it was like just wanting to see what everyone had. And you get that as a coach, but there are naturally going to be biases. And especially when you bring in Kevin Hayes, someone that he used to play with, signs like a seven year deal, which is just unbelievable, like $50 million. That's, that's big boy money. Um, there's, I guess, that natural hesitation where you've got so many prospects almost just teetering on the surface and almost ready to come up, but not quite. And there's been so much energy devoted to them over the past few years that there was that hesitation of, all right, well, is that all that just gone to waste now? We're not going to see these guys. Are they just going to rot in Lehigh? Are they going to be traded? Whatever. And I think just that strength of rotation, and it goes, I can't remember who exactly wrote the piece. I have a feeling it was Derek about Vigno um, and his like, fast starts, wherever he's been. And he's had like a oh really God. strong track record in the first. I, I've wrote a couple pieces on Vino. I know that, but I know Ricky's written one or two. Yeah, I wrote a few. Oh, I don't remember. Yeah. I think it Eric's wasn't me. I it was, wasn't. It was a PSL. Yeah, I mean, it's a it's a team effort at the end of the day. Like you know, we could we could always refer to who wrote it later, but yeah. it doesn't matter. The fact, yeah. the fact yeah. is, this, <laughs> he he. No matter what team he's coached, that team is always. I want to say every single team in his first year, he's went deep into the playoffs um, Mm -hmm. as a a head coach. I did that. I think I did that article. In my opinion, yes. They've done substantially better since, like, from the previous coach. I know we've done those pieces. You know, we Mm -hmm. dissected damn near everything we could about Vino (laughs) when he came to Philly. I think the only team that just saw the um, the same success was Vancouver. And I think Vancouver went from a playoff season to another playoff season with the with yeah. the you know, I don't think it dropped off. I think but, you're uh, right. That's yeah. it. I, I think every other team actually improved drastically, except the Rangers kind of fell off towards the end. But I mean, we took what was the best parts of the Rangers in Philly. So we All really right. fleeced that team. It was fantastic. Yeah. I pulled it up. I I did write something about his previous team. 
<laughs> and uh, Montreal will exclude that one because he, he came in mid-year. He came in mid-year. So, but Vancouver in his first season, they uh, were first in the first in division, lost in the conference semifinals. With New York, he made a cup run. And yep. now we see what he's doing with the Flyers. So was that the, was that the year that they a... lost uh, the, in the finals with uh, Henrik? Like Henrik had a chance at a cup. Was it when they so. beat a coach then? I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, he right. was when he he took them to the cup finals. He took them in Vancouver to the finals. Yeah. Who did I, they? I always, they see, lost to the Kings. They lost to the Kings in seven, right? Mm, yeah, it sounds about yeah, right. Yeah, they lost to the seven, Kings yeah, in right. seven, and I think Vancouver lost the. Boston and Boston in seven, seven. Yep. so both his because yeah, they almost Stanley tore Cup the whole city down <laughs> was seven games you know Vancouver so, almost burnt to the ground that night he's, he was just he was just <laughs> waiting for the right city to win his cup and Philly is is it Philly yeah I think and I agree welcome with never leave and we won't <laughs> let him <laughs> I honestly do I think Elaine Vigneault is the best coach in Philadelphia and that's for every sport and that's including the union or whatever you want to throw out there I think if you if you had to stack rank coaches I think it's unfair like I'm going to leave Joe Girardi out of it because I haven't seen him mm-hmm. actually do anything with the Phillies but it, I think it goes AV it goes Doug Peterson it goes Brett Brown and then whoever else after that jury's out on Girardi yeah like I think Girardi's going to do fine because yeah, but he, he hasn't, manage he hasn't game. managed like, the game Kapler, yet, Kapler lost 15 games last season I know we're straight away from hockey a little bit their capital lost 15 games last season, at least just because he had no idea of when to pull a pitcher or not. He just overthought yeah. things. So, mm-hmm. and it's kind of funny if you go if you compare that kind of philosophy, the coaching to mm-hmm. Elaine Vigneault. Elaine Vigneault never rethinks anything. He's like, "This is what we're rolling with, and if it bites me in the butt tonight, then we won't roll with it tomorrow or whatever." Like yeah. he, he has a plan set in motion. I like that about him. And to put this Very kind of in smart. perspective, like just kind of. From a coaching standpoint, I mean, I'm sure people are watching this. I don't know if you guys are, coach son, daughters, whoever's teams. Uh, as a coach myself, that rapport that you establish goes miles past talent. If you can, I mean, talent obviously is useful, but if you can establish that comfort and just get, making that connection like AV has with his players, every single one of them say it. You can go read any transcript of an interview with any of those guys. But that that goes leaps and bounds before town any day of the week. Well, so you know what you know what it is. It, it doesn't have to do with any of his coaching. It is the fact that he's a leader, and mm-hmm. he cares about the guys in that dressing room. And he talks to them. He tells them what they're doing. He tells them, you know, he's he communicates. And I mean, if if you want people to follow what you're putting out there, you have to be a leader. To be a leader, you have to care about everybody that's under your command for lack of better term. And you just get that feeling. I mean, there was nothing better than um, being at the game when it was the first game Limblom was at. I think it was the Anaheim game. Um, I think it was the Anaheim game. And he w- came into that press conference smiling from ear to ear, kind of like just glowing because he just saw Oscar and he saw his dad and and he was just like, He's that smile, you know, so, something to the effect of his smile, just, you know, and it was, it was pure. It was like, it was emotional. And I was just, I was so happy to be there for that and to see that and see what kind of guy he is because you can't fake that. You can't fake that, yeah. like carrying that emotion. And, and he shows that and those guys know, and they're ready to run through brick walls for him. After right. every single game, whether it's well, actually more importantly, um, if I've been to a game where, where they've lost, I'll see the way that Elaine Vigneault actually handles a press conference and just always very professional. He's actually the way, the way that he is lighthearted, even in a loss, like it doesn't take away from how serious of a coach he is or, or how much, you know, uh, he has to focus on the preparation for the next game. That's always on his mind. And that's apparent, but the way that he talks about his players and he says, you know, tonight, uh, I think he said Misha won one night when in a loss. Like, yeah, Misha had a pretty a few good shifts. I mean, there was a few where he didn't uh, have a good, sh- you know, he didn't have a few good minutes on the ice, and, he, and we paid for it. But after that, he kind of got his, you know, his act in order. He'll always give you, here's what happened, and here's how we we fix that. 
here's how the player reacted to this. He he's so transparent to the media, and I, it's that that right there it speaks volumes about the kind of coach that he is. He doesn't shy away from the important questions. He actually gives you a lot of the information up front, so you you know every single thing that's happening with with that team. I, Elaine Vigneault. Is not only is not only just great at having a uh, a lineup that's very effective against you know teams on a day to day basis. He's also very good at just being a professional in the coaching position, and he's probably going to be a guy which I wouldn't be surprised if he went into like a front office position if the Flyers wanted him down the line after his coaching career is over with. After multiple cups. After multiple cups, I think I honestly do believe at least two in the next seven years. I really do. I think I think our team is good enough. I mean, what you at least had 11, 10, 11 rookies, and not in counting rookies, you got Travis Kidnapney is twenty two, Gaturier is twenty seven, Kevin Hayes is twenty seven, Provorov's twenty three, Lawton's twenty five, Sandheim's twenty three, Farabee's nineteen. All those players are within top score to eleven score on the Flyers this season. The youth is is there forever, practically at this point. Like it's hard to find a t- uh, a player on this team that you're like, hey, he doesn't have the legs with him anymore. I mean, you got Chris Stewart is 32 and Nate Thompson is 35. Both of those guys, I think, are going to be in a one year deal in the nine off door anyway. Yeah. So. Yeah. So let's uh let's touch base on the last topic of the evening, and then we'll we'll kind of wrap it up. We're kind of probably going a little too long but hey when you get a bunch of people who have a lot of shit to say you know what we can keep going if we want to but what else is, is there to do it is our first <laughs> one so uh we want people coming back and uh um you know we there's there's been talk derek you kind of had an interesting piece a couple uh well, a couple weeks ago and yeah, it was... what a what if piece so let's hit it yeah, so I posed this to all of us, and I think all of us really touched on, we called it the flyer hypothetical, you know, the hypothetical series yeah. where we dish about, you know, what if this would have happened? What if that would have happened? My one piece that I really wanted to touch on was the 2007 draft lottery. Uh, it was the first year that the NHL used ping pong balls to decide the order, and they really did like a, a lottery system where each team has odds, each of the teams that didn't make the playoffs, I should say, to jump up to the top position. This was the year that the Flyers were slated to pick first, which everybody was excited about because the coveted prize of the draft was none other than Flyer killer himself, Patrick Kane. We'll get into that later. So they draw the ping pong balls and Patrick Kane goes to the Blackhawks because the Blackhawks got the first pick. I wanted to look at whether it would have made an impact if the Flyers would have drafted first and picked up Patrick Kane. Uh, you look at that, there was a lot of American talent, which was, uh, you know, I'm not going to say unheard of at that time, but Kevin Shattenkirk, Ryan McDonough, Max Pacioretty, just to name a few, were available in the first round, went in the first round. Um, Patrick Kane, I'm not even going to go into the stats, but we know he's had a better career to this point than James Van Riemsdyk. Nothing, not a slight on JVR. I, I like JVR as a player. I think he's a solid contributor, but you know, Patrick Kane's a nine-time All-Star. Calder Trophy in 08. He's won the Hart, the Ross, and the Pearson Trophy all in the same year, and he's won the Conn Smythe Trophy as well. Uh, he's won two Stanley Cups, I believe two, if I'm not mistaken. And the, the what, things I wanted to look at were kind of like the line of succession, the way things panned out with JVR, the way things panned out with Kane. If Patrick Kane was a flyer, the flyers would have never gotten Luke Shen. And I know damn well that would never have happened because are you going to trade Patrick Kane for Luke Shen? Like, come on. <laughs> um, no. You know, it would have – and that's like uh, I think Eric was saying about the butterfly effect. Like other things could happen. Maybe they trade him for a better defenseman or a bigger hole. That would have been stupid, and I would have been really upset. Yeah. Then we get to the 08 playoffs. Uh, you know, the Flyers ended up losing the Eastern Conference Finals in four games to one. Uh, Penguins were obviously the better team. They were a deep team, but they went on to lose to Detroit. Detroit was very good. Could Patrick Kane have made a difference? Because that year, you look at it, the Flyers' leading scorer was Mike Richards with 75 points. Patrick Kane tallied 72 on the year, and it would have been good for a tie with Danny Briere for second amongst Flyers that year. 
Um, the Chicago did not make the playoffs that year. Uh, you know, if they would have, or if the, if he would have been on the Flyers, I should say, he might have been able to get the Flyers to the Cup Finals. I'm not saying they would have won that Cup Finals because Detroit was incredibly stacked, but it's a Stanley Cup appearance. Two years later, the heartache that is kept with us this entire time for what is it, almost 10 years now. Yep. Game six, Patrick Kane buries the overtime winner. I was there in person. I was distraught. The entire two, two and a half hour ride home, I could have cried, but I didn't. Besides the point, I might have cried. Um, <laughs> but, you know, could JVR have scored that goal? Maybe. Like, but I don't have as much faith in JVR as I do Patrick Kane. If Patrick Kane and JVR swap spots right there in that series, I think that the Flyers would have won that Stanley Cup. JVR had two points in four games. For, he only played four games in that series against the Blackhawks this year or that year in 2010. He was tied for 12th with Dan Carcillo for points in the Stanley Cup finals for the Flyers. Patrick Kane was phenomenal. Uh, he would have been the leading scorer on the Flyers in the playoffs that year. So, you know, it's fun to look at these what ifs and it's fun to think like, what would happen? What would happen? I almost hold a grudge against the NHL for implementing that draft system that year, because that could have been the year that would have really molded the Flyers franchise around a guy like Patrick Kane, much the same as Chicago has with Patrick Kane, because now you've got Taves and Duncan Keith, who, you know, say what you will about him now, a couple of years back, he was one of the top defensemen, if not the top defenseman in the league, you know, Corey Crawford and net anti Niemi was the goalie that year when they won the cup, the Flyers, franchise would have been completely different and I think they would have brought at least one if not two cups to Philadelphia between then and now I look at these uh players that were taken that in the first uh in the first round like just through the first 10 picks currently the Flyers have two of the first 10 picks from that draft they have uh Borchek and they have Van Riemsdyk um <laughs> If you look at Patrick, I mean, Patrick Kane is clearly the superstar out of, that, out of that first round. You have a bunch of other players that you, you know of. They're not bad players. Uh, they have their moments, but none of them are like Patrick Kane. I would actually argue to say that if you're looking at forwards, Borachek or Kotor might be the two forwards afterwards that really opened my eyes in the first round. Um, but – yeah, I, I, I mean, I think if you take Patrick Kane with the rest of that team that we had in 2010 and the way that Van, Van Riemsdyk was playing in the playoffs in 2010, I think it's a um, it's a pretty good conclusion to, to draw that you probably would have had a, uh, a, a Stanley Cup winning team. My only thing is on that shot, I'm not sure that – only Patrick Kane makes that shot. I don't know how much of the, that it's a slight on Leighton and just on that yeah. particular uh, on that particular shot. I don't know if he saw it all. I don't, I don't know what happened. I remember seeing that shot go in, and after learning that that's a goal, I was like, wow, that, that was kind of a beach ball of a goal that you know, it was kind of a soft one that went in. But, um, I mean, I, I, if, if that's Van Reems, like shooting a puck, I mean, it doesn't really make much of a difference to me. However, I think over the course of the whole series, had we had Kane, we probably, yeah, we probably would have had a better opportunity to um, probably not even see game six. Probably probably could have wiped it off in game five, honestly. I mean, there are a, lot, a lot of things could have changed with just having Kane on that team. But then you also think, would the Flyers still go forward? Would they, uh, you know, where was Carl Alsner on their on their uh, – Board, on their board, like Carl Alsner, great defenseman for Washington Capitals for a bunch of years. Um, everything that happens, I know this is 2007, but we don't have uh, Pronger yet. So mm -hmm. it's probably worth looking at a defenseman. I think we have more depth at forward than we did, did on defense. So I'm not sure that if we didn't take Van Riemsdyk and Kane was already out of the way, that we would have kept with a, um, with a forward. I mean, there were two defensemen that went in the first five as well, Alzner being one of them. Yeah. But, 
at that point, though, how do you argue not taking Patrick Kane? Hey, hey mean, if you're number one, hindsight's twenty twenty. Like, that's but, exactly what it is. Like, if you're number one, you take Kane. If uh, yeah. if you're if you do hindsight, and you're still just taking it at number two, mm-hmm. uh, Van Riemsdyk's a pretty solid pick. But maybe you do look at trading a, down. A Gagne, maybe. I mean, he didn't have a bad career either. He just you know quietly went away in Edmonton. Yeah. So that's real. I mean, there's there's different ways to take it, but if you have that first overall pick, yeah, you definitely take Kane. There's really no way around that. For sure. It's weird though, isn't it? I mean, I know it's not exactly Flyers related, but I took a bit of inspiration from the series that you guys have been pumping out to the Eagles recently. And, you know, there was a lot of talk, I think, about, you know, the Eagles missing in the last couple of drafts when there's been a lot of depth that key needs. So, like, 2017, you had Christian McCaffrey, who's now, like, the highest paid running back in the league. You've got Alvin Cook. You had Tariq Cohen. The Eagles come away with Donnell Pumphrey, and everyone's like, well, what if they'd just taken Dalvin Cook? And I'm like, well, that's great. But then you probably wouldn't have had LeGarrette Blunt. So, you probably can argue whether or not you would have got to a Super Bowl. And Miles Sanders definitely wouldn't be an Eagle. So it's like, it's hindsight is twenty twenty. you know. I think the, that one shot alone that you singled out could very easily hear, all right, if the, the boot was on the other foot, then we're absolutely looking at a Stanley Cup winning team. I think outside of that, it's very much, you can make the argument either side of it, but it's, it's so much fun to hypothesize. And then you could be here half an hour into a debate and you'll be talking about 2037 and how the team would have like moved on from Kane and like where we yeah. are in like a few yeah. years. But how does it affect the team now? Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares if we had a couple cups, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. <laughs> so, it, it, yeah, it was definitely, you know, one of those, you know, as a younger typical Philly f- fan, oh, the NHL is just trying to screw us again. You know, and I think what they win twenty two games that year. I remember getting tickets for five bucks. Yeah, that's how bad it was that year. Yeah, yeah tickets they for really five bucks. Dropped off the radar. Was that the? Are, are you you're talking about the? Uh, hmm, I might have missed the very beginning of that. Are you talking about the season where there was a strike? No, I don't think I that, that was that a. Nah. Before what you're talking about. Yeah, this was the. Uh, this was. Um, it was the two thousand six two thousand seven season because I okay. I hadn't been home from living down south for a while a year and uh i remember five buck five dollar tickets yeah it was they were playing that bad they were that bad that year i remember a particular season where we had the worst uh record and pretty much the worst record in the league where i think we won 30 games so yeah i mean having this opportunity to talk about uh you know whether you take uh kane if you have the first overall pick i mean that's a no-brainer yeah. You can't go back now and change that first overall pick, no matter what team you are. I think all the teams in the league there, and they talk about uh, taking Patrick Kane at the end. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, this is about – our time's about up here. So, um Aww. want to try and wrap it up. We definitely are going to start doing this again, and we'll we'll talk some more topics. And, you know, um, I don't know if you guys would want to do a mailbag. I think we should try and incorporate yes. that, get some fan yeah. action involved or yeah. some some followers. So um, I just want to thank you guys. Um, this was a lot of fun. And, I mean, you all brought a bunch of wealth of knowledge. And it was, again, it was easy for me to just sit here and look stupid. Um, I kind of, kind of my thing. But, uh, again, thanks for the time. And let's get through this and we'll do it again next week or so yeah absolutely yeah. I the beer to all that man. all right i don't have a beer but i've got a cheap pringles so. uh, i got a pepsi <laughs> <laughs> cheers awesome. fellas and uh let's bring back hockey yeah thank you <laughs>